Well, hallelujah, and welcome back, friends, to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And together, the people of God say, hallelujah. Well, friends, have you been in the Word this morning? Have you talked to the Father this morning? Have you surrendered yourself to His service and to His will? I pray that you have. And if you have, we will be one in the Spirit, and that will prepare your souls for the receiving of God's Word. Now today is June 17th of the year 2017, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now we are continuing our look into the seven churches in the book of Revelation, and today we are at the Church of Pergamum. So if you have your Bible in front of you, Revelation chapter 2, and let's pick up at verse 12. Now we're going to read the entire text. And then we'll come back and we'll dissect what we have read. It says in verse 12, To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly." And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now, in order for us to understand this text, we're going to have to look a little bit deeper into the Bible, and most certainly we're going to have to look at some historical facts. So let's go back to verse 12 and let's dissect this. He says, Unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now, the sharp sword with two edges here is defined for us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 which says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the two-edged sword in our text is the word of God, and it is quick. In other words, when we read the word of God, the word of God is quick to penetrate our souls, to reveal our thoughts, to reveal our hidden motives, put quite simply, to reveal our sin. And we may excuse it or try to justify it but the word is quick and powerful in pricking our consciences. And that's why many people don't read the Bible. Because they don't want to be reminded of their sin, where they are failing God. And they know it. The Spirit of God reveals it to them through their conscience. But they bury it as if it's not that important. But according to the Word of God, friends, a lie is just as detrimental to us as God's people as murder is. And so continuing in Hebrew, it says, it pierces even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And listen to this. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You see, friends, we can lie to everyone else. We can fool everyone else, but we cannot lie to ourselves. On the surface, we may but when we examine ourselves, we know the true intents of our hearts, of our thoughts, and the Word of God helps reveal those intentions to us. Back to Revelation chapter 2, he says in verse 13, I know your works. I know what you're doing for me. I know how faithful you are in obedience to me. And I know where you dwell. I know where you live. You live in the seat of Satan. And so in the privacy of your home, there may be tranquility. There may be peace. But the moment you step out your door, you are in a pagan world, a pagan culture. And your soul is being vexed on every side. 
And I know how easy it would be for you to conform to the world around you. And he says, yet you hold fast my name. You're not ashamed of my name. You proclaim my name where you can and when you can. And you have not denied my faith. Even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. Now to better understand the culture of the Pergamos church, I want to refer to John MacArthur's commentary. And this is what he says. Some identify Satan's seat with the magnificent altar of Zeus that dominated Pergamon's Acropolis. The word altar is somewhat misleading. The structure is a monumental colonnaded court in the form of a horseshoe. It is 120 feet by 112 feet. The altar itself was nearly 18 feet high. At the base of the structure, it was 446 feet, and it depicted a battle of the gods against the giants. It was one of the greatest works of Hellenistic art. So some think that Satan's seat mentioned here in the letter to the Pergamos church is referring to this altar. Others connect Satan's seat with the worship of the god Asclepius that was prevalent in Pergamon. Asclepius was the god of healing, and people came from all over the ancient world to Pergamon, seeking to be healed at his shrine. Asclepius was depicted as a snake, and non-poisonous snakes roamed freely in his temple. Suppliants seeking healing either slept or lay down on the temple's floor, hoping to be touched by one of the snakes, which symbolically represented the god himself and thereby they would be healed. So we can see from the mind of a Christian, here is a God represented as a snake, certainly that would represent Satan. There are others that believe that Satan's seat refers to emperor worship, because Pergamum was the leading center of emperor worship in the province of Asia, and the cult of emperor worship certainly posed the gravest threat to the Christians in Pergamum. It was for their refusal to worship the emperor, not the pagan gods, that Christians faced execution. Just as Nebuchadnezzar commanded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow before him when the music sounded, and they refused to do so, and he threw them into the fiery furnace to be killed, so many Christians were killed because they would not pay homage to the emperor. All their homage, all their allegiance was to the Lord Jesus. And so whichever view you take here, most assuredly it's certain that the Christians refused to pay homage to an altar, to an emperor, or to a false god, and instead directed all their allegiance, all their attention, all their worship to the Lord Jesus. And for this, they were persecuted severely. Now Jesus here at the end of verse 13 uses this man Antipas as an example of faithfulness. And Antipas most likely was the pastor of the Pergamos church. And so in order to make an example to the Pergamos church, the emperor understanding that the best way to kill the body is to sever the head. So in order to sever and attack the head, he places their pastor, the head or leader of the church, in a brass bull and roasts him alive. And as all the horrific and painful ways that a person could die... Being roasted in a brass bowl has to be near the top of the list. And yet these Christians count it a privilege to die in such a way for their Lord. And Jesus himself finds it commendable. But in verse 14, he says, I have a few things against thee, because you have them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now, before we define who Balak and Balaam are, note that the real purpose of the condemnation from the Lord Jesus is that, that they have them there among them that hold these false doctrines. And so what Jesus is saying is what he told his disciples very early on in his ministry. A little leaven destroys the entire lump. You cannot allow these false teachers and these false teachings in among you. If you do, they will destroy you. And so what we see here is a lack of church discipline. 
And church discipline was important then and it is important now. And the reason that we see so much falsehood in the church today is because there is no church discipline. No one is holding anyone accountable. When is the last time you heard of someone being kicked out of a fellowship? Removed from a church. Not because they're struggling with sin, but because they're practicing sin. As if there were no consequences. There's a huge difference. And so Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, you should exercise patience, love, and compassion as you are dealing with these young believers to flee from their sin. But if they're unwilling to flee from their sin, remove them from the fellowship. You've been to them privately and they've rejected you. You've taken two or more and they've rejected you. Now in verse 17, he says, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. And if he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man. Remove them from your fellowship. In verse 18, he says, whatsoever you will bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So if you remove them from the fellowship on earth, I'll remove them from the fellowship in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So if you forgive them on earth, I will forgive them in heaven. I've placed my authority upon you. You represent me. And that's why he says in verse 19, if any of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them by my Father which is in heaven. Where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of you. That has nothing to do with a small fellowship, friends. It has to do with church discipline. When two of you, according to the word of God, act faithfully to the word of God and remove a practicing sinner from your fellowship, Jesus is there backing you and supporting you, giving you his authority to do so. And yet, that's where they failed in Revelation chapter 2 here in the letter to the church of Pergamos. They are not acting on church discipline. And so Jesus says, for that very reason, I have this against you. Romans chapter 1, verses 29, 30, and 31 give us an entire list of things that are unfavorable to be exercised or practiced within the fellowship, within the church of the living God. We have such things as fornication, covetousness, murder, debate, interestingly enough, backbiters, haters of God, inventors of evil things, without understanding, without natural affection, unmerciful. But notice verse 32. He says, who knowing the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only those that do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And in the Greek that says, those who not only do the same, but those who agree with them that do them. And so what Jesus is saying is, look, by the very fact that you're not dealing with it and excommunicating them from your fellowship, because you're not disagreeing with them, then you're agreeing with them. You see, people have never liked confrontation. It seems that people always want to pass the buck. Well, I'm not going to deal with it. Let somebody else deal with it. But we have an individual responsibility to hold one another accountable, friends. Paul himself told one of his churches to turn a practicing sinner over to Satan so that hopefully he would realize his mistakes and convert back to the Lord Jesus. And yet, the Pergamos church refuses to deal with such a one who is practicing these abominable acts. Now, in order to better understand the story of Balaam and Balak, I would encourage you to read Numbers chapter 20 through, through chapter 25. But basically, Balak is the king of Moab, and he sees the way that the Israelites are defeating the nations around him. And so he calls upon Balaam a prophet of God, and asks him to curse the people of Israel. And in Numbers 24, 13, Balaam says, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own hand. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. And so God won't allow Balaam to place a curse on Israel. And so what they do is they devise a plan to corrupt the people of Israel so that they will no longer be under the blessing of God. 
And in Numbers 25, we see the result of that. In verse 1, it says, Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Now remember, Balak is the king of Moab. And the plan is to bring the men from Israel to the daughters of Moab so that the daughters of Moab will seduce them and lead them into worshiping their false gods. And that's what we see in verse 2. They called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And so basically what we see taking place here is that the people of God are aligning themselves with the pagan culture around them. And that's really the focus of this text. They're compromising their spiritual values and they're becoming one with the world around them. And listen to what the word of God says about such compromise. John chapter 15 verse 19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you are not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, the world hates you. Romans 12 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Titus 2.12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. James 1.27 says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17 say, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and its lusts. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So God's word is very clear on the position that we are to take to this world. And it is not to be one of compromise, joining ourselves with the world, but we are to clearly define that we are the people of God and we resist and deny the world around us. But Pergamos hasn't done that. They've aligned themselves with false teachers and sinful practices. That's what 15 says. So also do you hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now remember, that's simply those who teach the doctrines of men over the doctrines of God. And Jesus says, I hate this thing. So he says in verse 16, you better repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against them. He's not going to fight against the righteous in the church. He's going to fight against the false teachers and the false believers in the church. And he'll do so with the word of God, with the word or the sword of his mouth. Now he ends in verse 17 by saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Now remember, the manna was the bread that fell from heaven that kept the Israelites alive during their early wanderings in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. And yet Jesus tells us man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the hidden manna is the word of God. It's Jesus himself. Jesus is the word. And just as he told his disciples, take this bread for it is my body, that's what he's saying here. If you overcome, I will give you to eat of the hidden manna. I will bestow upon you my nature, my character, my spirit. And he says, I will also give you a white stone. And in that stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now, referring back to MacArthur's commentary for a moment, this is what he says about the white stone. He says, there are some that link it with the Urim and Thummim on the breastplate of the high priest. And these stones were used to determine God's will and represent the right of the high priest to request guidance from God for the leader who could not approach God directly. 
but he had to come through the priestly structure. Somehow, God caused those stones to disclose his will in a form beyond just the simple yes and no of casting lots. According to this view, by this white stone, God promises the overcomer's knowledge of his will. Others identify the white stone as a diamond, the most precious of stones, symbolizing God's precious gift of eternal life to believers. It seems best, however, to understand the white stone in light of the Roman custom of awarding white stones to the victors in athletic contests. A white stone inscribed with the athlete's name served as his ticket to a special awards banquet. In this view, Christ promises the overcomer's entrance to the eternal victory celebration in heaven. And so basically what Jesus is saying is as a contestant in a marathon works so hard to be able to run the race and he strives so diligently to reach the finish line and if he finishes ahead of others, he's going to receive a medal of honor. Jesus says, so will I do for you. If you will stand against the opposition of sin and hypocrisy and false teaching, if you will defend my name and my word, if you will stand boldly and defy all of those who compromise my teachings, I will reward you in the same fashion that Olympian is honored at his award ceremony. And so we see in this text a commendation to the people of God. We see a condemnation against the people of God. We see a warning that all the people of God should pay close attention to. And we see a goal that each of us should strive to succeed in. And though lengthy and detailed is the letter of the Church of Pergamos, we should all walk away highly charged in our service and our allegiance to our King. So friends, go and serve him faithfully throughout today. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I love you, friends, and I'll see you on the next video.